Good afternoon and good morning, if that's your time zone, and welcome to the ELEX webinar on cataloging law materials with RDA. I'm Jane Rosario. I'm a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'm your host today. Our presenter today is John Hostage, the Authorities and Database Integrity Librarian at the Harvard Law School Library. John has been involved in cataloging at the Harvard Law School Library since 1982. He served on various task forces connected to Alexa's Committee on Cataloging, Description, and Access. And for the past three years, he has been the representative from the American Association of Law Libraries to CCDA. He also served on the Standing Committee of the IFLA Cataloging Section from 2005 to 2011. During this session, if you have questions for John, please type them into the question box on your screen and John will answer them as they come up during his presentation. There will also be a little time at the conclusion of his presentation for questions. Also, please note today's session will be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. A copy of John's slides will also be provided. Um, so now, uh, please bear with us. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to John. Welcome, this is John Hostage, and uh, I'll be your presenter today. Um, there's a, a picture and my contact information. Uh, we're going to, here's an outline of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll start with a little bit about the foundations of RDA. Uh, we won't go into a lot of detail. We, I assume that you've heard about it in other workshops or webinars, etc. Uh, we'll talk about access points for works, and then rules for specific kinds of legal works, such as laws, etc., treaties, etc., and other legal works. Now I'll we'll <coughs> talk a little about, about the foundations of RDA. Uh, RDA is based on the uh, IFLA functional requirements conceptual models. Um, these are the uh, functional requirements for bibliographic records, sometimes known as FERBER, and the functional requirements for authority data, or FRAD. Uh, <clears throat> these were developed by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And um, there's a third model, uh, functional requirements for subject authority data, uh, which just came out recently and was not incorporated directly into RDA. Um, these models uh, have attributes and relationships which are reflected in elements in um, RDA. And uh, among the most important ones are the what are known as the Ferber Group 1 entities, work, expression, manifestation, and item, and the FRAD entities, person, family, corporate body, and place. Uh, there are some law-related instructions for access points for legal works. Um, and uh, in ACR 2, there are uh, rules for main and added entries for certain kinds of works, such as laws, court rules, or court decisions. Uh, RDA is a little different. Um, it has a different kind of arrangement. And it talks about preferred titles and authorized access points for works. Um, and uh, it's broken up <laughs> into different ways. Uh, this is the beginning of the rules for the access points for legal works, and you can see that it uh, breaks down an arrangement for different types of works, and it mentions laws, etc., but this shouldn't be ex uh, confused with the uh, so-called preferred title laws, etc., which is used uh, for only certain kinds of laws, um, but uh, this uh, sort of first arrangement here gives you links to the specific rules for the different types you can see that it talks about. <clears throat> now we'll talk in a little more detail about these access points for works. And the first thing to do is to determine your preferred title for a legal work. Um, and sometimes you have additions to a preferred title. And these can be such as things such as a date or other distinguishing characteristics, which meaning protocols, etc., or a signatory to a treaty. 
um, and when you construct your access points, you build it on that preferred title that you've chosen. And sometimes you combine it with an access point uh, for a creator or an other person or a corporate body associated with the work. <clears throat> this is the basic rule in RDA for recording creators. <clears throat> a creator is a person, family, or corporate body responsible for the creation of the work. And the rules give examples for different types of creators for these different kinds of categories that you can see on the screen. Uh, these are some more. And in, in some cases, you just have one creator for a particular work. And in others, you can have multiple creators, such as for treaties. There's another category called other persons, families, or corporate bodies associated with legal works. Um, these are not considered creators, um, but they're uh, also listed uh, different categories that should be recorded. And you can see some of them here. Uh, in some cases, these other persons or corporate bodies are used in uh, creating, creating an authorized access point even if there's a, another person or corporate body which might be the creator for that work. An example is uh, the court governed by the rules, um, <clears throat> which is uh, not considered a creator, but would be used in the authorized access point. <clears throat> These are some other categories of other persons and corporate bodies that are, uh, can be used in access points. and some more categories. An important uh, element or concept in RDA is the core elements, which these are things that uh, should be in every record. Um, and you can have different kinds of creators and contributors in the same work, and you can record them all regardless of their role and uh, it's only when you go to the rules for creating access points that you uh, sort of figure out what to do with those uh, creators and other persons that you've recorded. Uh, for creators, the category of creators, the principal creator or the first named one is a core element, so should always be recorded. And for the other persons or corporate bodies that we just talked about, <laughs> they're it's, it's a core element if it's used to construct the authorized access point for the work. The rules for the access points for various kinds of legal works are in uh, 6.29. We just saw the screenshot of that. And for th works which do not, do not fall into the categories that are in that rule, then you uh, go to the general rules uh, for all kinds of works in 6.27. Uh, <coughs> rules for access points are generally built on the rules for the preferred title for legal works. Now we'll talk a little bit about specific kinds of legal works. And here again is <coughs> that general rule with the uh, links to the different uh, types of rules for different kinds of legal works. The first uh, of these is laws governing one jurisdiction. And to create an, uh, such an, uh, an authorized access, access point, uh, you start with the jurisdiction governed by the law. Um, take an example, Canada. And you add to it the preferred title for the law <coughs> or the laws. Um, in this case, an example, Canada Corporations Act. And you put those together and you have your authorized access point. Um, these rules are very similar to the ACR2 rules for uniform title. And the preferred title, laws, etc., is still used for complete or partial compilations other than sub subject compilations, just as in ACR2. <clears throat> there are uh, guidelines for choosing the preferred title for a law, and these are the, the same uh, guidelines as in ACR2 Chapter 25, um, starting with the official or short title or citation title, etc. 
constitutions uh, don't have a special rule. They're included in the rule for laws governing uh, jurisdiction. And uh, there's not a rule for shortening the preferred title as there was in ACR2, but uh, the Library of Congress uh, policy statement uh, for this rule says to use constitution or its equivalents, so that's basically the same effect as we had in ACR2. There are additions to access points uh, for laws, um, the chief one being uh, the year of promulgation when needed to break a conflict, as in this example of, of French code, where it had a new code replacing the original one from 1806, so we had the year of promulgation to uh, the code for the new one. Um, laws governing more than one jurisdiction are uh, treated according to a general rule for compilations, and uh, you end up using the preferred title for the comp compilation. Uh, in this case, an example of narcotic laws of Mexico and the United States. Those are laws of two countries. So we just use the preferred title in this authorized access point. In certain countries, administrative regulations, etc., our laws are considered to be laws in uh, such countries as the United Kingdom and Canada. And in this case, we follow the same rules for access points as we do for laws. So you can have an example of uh, entering the Queen's regulation and orders for the Canadian forces under the jurisdiction that is Canada, <clears throat> or for a compilation, general compilation of all the regulations of New Brunswick, use the preferred title laws, etc., uh, just as you do for general compilation of laws under New Brunswick. For Bills and drafts of legislation, uh, you start with the access point for the legislative body where the bill uh, was entered, and you add the preferred title for the bill, um, as in this example. For other drafts of the legislation, that is, that have not been uh, entered as a bill in the legislature, you combine the access point for the creator. Uh, this uh, case uh, that a person, and you add the preferred title for that draft to the legislation. For ancient laws, medieval laws, customary laws, we have the same <coughs> rule as we had under AACR2. Um, you choose, but there's a certain order of uh, pref preference, uh, the title by which the law is known, <coughs> or the title proper of the resource. In countries like the United States, administrative regulations are not laws, <coughs> and uh, in that case, uh, the access points used for the um, uh, preferred access point or authorized access point uh, starts with the agency or agents that is promulgating the regulations, and <coughs> you add the preferred title for the regulations. <coughs> so in this case, we have the Illinois Department of Health as the agency. Um, note that the word department is no longer abbreviated um, in RDA. Actually, that was not an official ACR2 abbreviation, but that was carried over by rule interpretation. Um, and then the rules and regulations for recreational areas as the preferred title. The rules governing a single court, um, you start with the access point for the court that is governed by the rules, and you add the preferred title for the rules, <coughs> as in this example. Um, the, the court governed by the rules is not considered the creator by RDA, but uh, it's one of the other persons, uh, family or corporate bodies associated with the work. Um, <coughs> the promulgating agency or enacting jurisdiction for the rules would be the creator um, but they're not used, in this case, in the uh, authorized access point. <coughs> Constitutions, charges, etc., for international and inter intergovernmental bodies uh, are, have an authorized access point uh, where you start with the 
access point for the body, in this case an example of the United Nations, and you add the preferred title for the constitution, etc. And um, most likely this um, preferred title would also be shortened under the Library of Congress uh, policy statement to just charter. Now we'll talk about treaties and other international agreements. This is the biggest area of difference uh, from ACR2. Treaties are, uh, have authorized access points that starts with the name of the party that comes in, under ASR2 was the name of the party that comes first in the English alphabetical order, but in RDA it will be the one that's named first in the resource, including for multilateral treaties. And RDA gives these examples for recording creators for treaties, and you can see that you can re record however many treaties, and meaning uh, signatories as creators as there are. So um, for some multilateral treaties, you could have dozens. Um, however, only the first one is considered a, a core element, and let, except for the case of bilateral treaties, in which case you also need the uh, other signatory to a bilateral treaty as uh, to be considered core. So between treaties between national governments, you start with the government that's named first. Um, there is an exception if there's a, gov a government on one side and two or more on the other side, then you use the government that's on the one side. Then you add the preferred title for the treaty, and this preferred title is treaties, etc. Um, that rule is shown here for the different types of treaties where you use treaties, etc. Those under national governments, international gover intergovernmental bodies, the Holy See, or jurisdictions below the national level with treaty making powers. These are the cases where you use treaties, etc. as your preferred title. This is an example of a, a, a treaty between the United States and Bulgaria. Title page for that. And to, when you create the authorized access point, you have to make certain additions, including the name of the second party, in this case, Bulgaria, and the date or earliest date of signing, and your full access point looks like this. You're starting with the first named party, which in this case is the United States, not going in alphabetical order, and adding treaties, etc. as your um, pre preferred title, and the second party and the date. And note that names of the months are no longer abbreviated in RDA. What happens if you can't identify the first signatory? Um, sometimes they aren't named, or the, you, uh, the, the resources you have might be in, inconsistent. Um, if there's no consistency, then you use the government name first and the first resource received. However, if the first signatory can't be determined, then you use the preferred title of the treaty. There's an exa example agreement establishing the World Trade Organization. Here's a the text of that treaty, um, and it just talks about the parties to this agreement without naming them. I'll blow that up a little bit. The uh, beginning of that treaty it, um, it just uh, gives the title and the text of the treaty without naming the signatories. There are additions uh, to treaties um, that are entered under the uh, name of the treaty and you add the year or the early, earliest year of signing. Uh, in the Joint Steering Committee uh, for the development of RDA, which governs the text of RDA, uh, there has been some discussion about standardizing dates of treaties um, so that we don't have a year in some cases and year, month, and day in other cases. Um, but at this point, the rules stand uh, pretty much as they were carried over from ACR2. 
now we'll talk about some other kinds of international agreements in uh, the, the case of uh, agreements contracted by international intergovernmental bodies. Um, you basically follow the same rules as for international treaties and uh, use the first name party and the preferred title treaties. <coughs> and these uh, categories are carried over uh, from ACR2 Chapter 1. As an example, <coughs> the agreement between the UN and the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, again, you start with the first name party and add the preferred title and the second party and the date. Agreements contracted by the Holy See, again, you follow the same rule as for international treaties. As an example, this one between Italy and the uh, Holy See, you start with the first name party and the preferred title, then you give the other party and the date. There are some other categories. When you have two or more jurisdictions be below the national level or a national government and one or more jurisdictions within this country, you follow the rules, the general rules for collaborative works and you do not use um, treaties, etc. as a preferred title. So example of two jurisdictions between the national, below the national level, you have an agreement between Maine and New Brunswick and you start with the first named party, in this case Maine, and the preferred title for the agreement, which is basically the title proper of that agreement. Or another example, an, an agreement between the national government and one of its jurisdictions, its lower level jurisdictions. You have an agreement between Ontario and Canada. In this case, Ontario was named first, so the uh, authorized access point starts with Ontario and the title of that agreement. And, and you notice these do not use treaties, etc. as preferred title. Um, you can also have agreements between jurisdictions below the national level and one or more intergovernmental, international intergovernmental bodies. In this case, you do use uh, treaties, etc. or between a national government and one more jurisdiction below the national level outside the country. Um, in this case, again, use treaties, etc. Here's an example of an agreement between the United States and the British Virgin Islands. So again, you, you start with the first name party, use the preferred title, treaties, etc. Add the second party and the dates of signing. <clears throat> there are other agreements. Uh, if you have two or more national governments and one or more jurisdictions below the national level, you follow the general rules again <clears throat> using it with the first name party and preferred title treaties, etc. Uh, <clears throat> for other agree agreements, you have a government at any level and a non-governmental corporate body. Again, this is treated as a collaborative work under the general rules and you do not use treaties, etc. cetera. Um, so in this example, you have uh, Liberia, Liberia because that's named first as the beginning of your authorized access point and then the title of the agreement. <clears throat> Protocols, amendments, etc., to treaties are treated pretty much the same as they were under ACR2. You start with the authorized access point for the treaty, and then you add protocols, etc., and the date of the signing of that protocol to that access point. <clears throat> so, in this example, you have an agreement between Ireland and Portugal, um, and then you add to that heading protocols, etc., and the date of that signing. For compilations of treaties, basically you use the same access point as you would for a single agreement, um, whether it's between two parties or between one party and two or more on the other side. And for 
other compilations, you just use the general instructions for compilations. Now we'll talk a little bit about some other legal works. These are generally, generally related to courts and court cases. Uh, most of these rules are carried over from ACR2. When you have a, reports of one court and they're not ascribed to a reporter, use the access point for the court and add the preferred title for the reports. So in this example, the court is Canada Federal Court and the reports are Canada Federal Court reports. So this forms your authorized access point. If the reports are not issued under the authority of the courts, you use the title as your access point. Uh, reports of cases argued and determined in the Court of Appeals of Arizona, for example. If the reports of one court are ascribed to a report, reporter or reporters, you use the access point for the reporter or the court depending on citation practice. However, um, the CCDA, the Committee on Cataloging Description and Access, has agreed to a proposal to revise the rules to always use the access point for the, for the court when you have reports of a single court. However, this change has not yet been approved by the Joint Steering Committee, so it's not yet part of RDA, but this simplification might be coming in the near future. Here's an example of reports by one reporter um, by uh, Richard Freeman is the reporter noted at the bottom of the screen. So the authorized access point for these reports is formed by using the access point for the reporter, then adding the preferred title for the reports. Um, in this case, the title proper of the reports. When you have reports of more than one court, um, and the reporter or reporters not, are not, not responsible for all the reports, you use the preferred title um, for the reports. And um, this example of uh, Australian law reports, which um, give the reports from several courts, the High Court of Australia and uh, state courts, etc. Um, these are entered under, under the preferred title. For citations, digests, etc., um, if the compiler is prominently named, you combine the access point for the person with the preferred title for the reports. Otherwise, if the compiler is not prominently named, use a preferred title as your authorized access point. And now we get into some more obscure types of publications, um, criminal proceedings and um, appeals proceedings. Here's an example of a report of a trial, a criminal trial, uh, names the uh, uh, the defendants and it names a reporter. Um, for these uh, authorized access points, you start with the access point for the defendant or the first name defendant, in this case Levitt Alley, and you add the preferred title for the proceedings. This is an example of non-criminal proceedings, an equity case, and it names and both parties in the case, as well as the court where it was heard. In this case, to create the authorized access point for the proceedings, you start with the access point for the plaintiff, for the first name defendant, or first name plaintiff, that is, and you add the preferred title for the proceedings. For an indictment, here's an example of an indictment um, title page. <clears throat> you follow the rules for criminal proceedings. That is, you combine the 
access point for the person uh, indicted plus the preferred title for the title of the indictment. A charge to a jury is, here's an example of a charge by uh, Judge Patterson in a specific case in 1795. In this case, you combine the access point for the court with the preferred title for the charge. And now we have a judicial decision in a particular case. And uh, this uh, decision was published separately under this title, Freedom of the Press, Opinion of the Supreme Court, etc. And in this case, you combine the access point for the court with the preferred title for the decision. Now, judicial opinions are distinguished from judicial decisions, um, and uh, the decisions are decisions of the court, whereas uh, an opinion is just the opinion of one judge, and normally it might be a dissenting opinion. That is, it is not the controlling decision of the, the court in the case. So in that case, you uh, combine the access point for the judge and not for the court with the preferred title for the opinion. You can see that this is a dissenting opinion. When you have the records of one party, such as a brie or a plea, plea in a case, the authorized access point is uh, created by combining the access point for the party uh, that is being represented in that um, brief or plea with the preferred title uh, of the brief. <laughs> or another kind of uh, record for the party it might be a lawyer's argument. Here's a title page for an argument that was published separately. Um, gives the name of the lawyer and the case, and the uh, argument is entered under the access point for the lawyer, combined with the preferred title for the argument. So thank you. Are there any questions? Um, there's a question whether I can see the question. No, I can't. I'm just going to read the question out loud. Um, we have a question from Jessica Weimer, who's asking, is there an example of about the example of the jurisdiction governed. She says AACR2 was accessed first under govern rather than creator. And she asks, is this correct that it's different from AACR2? Um, we're talking about laws. Um, the laws are still um, entered under the jurisdiction that's governed. Um, usually that's the same jurisdiction that uh, creates the law, but um, in cases where it's not, the uh, the authorized access point would be created by uh, using the uh, access point for the jurisdiction governed, as far as I know. Okay. 
Mary Curran asks, is there only one change then with the treaties? As far as, I, I'm assuming it's between AACR2 and RDA. Uh, the ma major change is that um, you choose your the, the beginning of your authorized access point by uh, what, the party that's named first. Um, instead of using English alphabetical order, um, that's the the major one. The, another part of that is that um, even multilateral treaties are treated this way. Um, so, if it were, you know, if it had a hundred signatories and they were named, they would, you would still create the authorized access points uh, using the first named one. Uh, there's another small change um, having to do with uh, when there's uh, two or three parties and Right now, I'm not remembering the details of it. Muted. But um, under uh, ACR two, if there was a you had a government on one side and uh, two on the other side, um, then it was entered under the first one, and four more were entered under title. Um, and that's a little bit different under RDA. And right now, I'm not sure the details of that. OK. It's a little complicated with the treaties. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, the next question is, can you show an example of a record from Jay Lapache? J. Lapache, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm sorry. The oh, question is, the question can, was. You, <laughs> yeah, can you show an example of a record in the uh, person asking the question is J. Lapache? Oh, um, I don't have any examples of records prepared, no. Um, and uh, I was trying to, you know, RDA is not uh, written in terms of mark, um, and I was trying to sort of get it the, the basic concepts um, and uh, rather than you know mark coding and so on okay um, the next question is from Annie Chen uh, asking if you could discuss amicus briefs um, they're not mentioned specifically but briefs uh, for one party are um, entered of uh, under the name of the party that's uh, represented. So um, I'm pretty sure that uh, you would start with the access point for the, the party uh, that's submitting the brief um, or for whom that was prepared. And uh, if another person or organization um, prepared that brief, it would um, probably be treated in that category of uh, other persons or corporate bodies uh, related to work and um, it doesn't uh, say what you have to do with that information but uh, normally you would create an added entry with that uh, other person or body. Okay, um, the next question is from Rhonda Lawrence and she asks, is CCDA looking at changes to the rules of entries for treaties? That might be the same question as earlier. Uh, so far, I don't think any proposal has been made. Um, it's uh, possible that uh, AAAWL, the American Association of Law Libraries, might uh, put one forward. Um, people are not too happy with these new rules um, for um, access points for treaties, but um, the Joint Steering Committee wanted to create a sort of consistent rules with other kinds of works that are uh, they considered a co collaboration between um, different bodies, governments, whatever, um, and they wanted to treat them the same, same way they um, treat other collaborative works in effect when those other types of works are also 
have your authorized access point uh, combining the first named creator or, or body or whatever it is uh, for your access point. Okay. Um, another question about treaties. Mary Curran asks, is the only real change then with treaties or did I miss others? Um, I, I'm afraid to not, I don't know what, if I want to say that's the only change, but that's the biggest change. Um, most of the other things we talked about today do represent just carrying over of um, the uh, rules from ACR2. And um, so off the top of my head, I can't think of any other big changes. Uh, there hopefully will be a change for reports of a single court um, if the Joint Steering Committee accepts the proposal that's been made. Um, it's, um, so I can't think of any other changes right now. Okay. Um, another question from Jay Lapache. Uh, can we apply the jurisdiction rules to municipal, county, and city level materials? Yes. Um, if we're talking about laws and ordinances, um, yes, um, it can be applied to any jurisdiction, I believe. Okay. Uh, this is from Bill Sleeman. Could you please review how to handle a Supreme Court of the U.S. opinion? Um, that's, uh, if it's published separately, um, as an example we had, um, we can go back to that or I can try to go back. This is, well, apparently I can't. Um, anyways, uh, we took the, the, the opinion was entered under the, the access point for the Supreme Court, so it's the United States Supreme Court. And uh, in the case of the separately published decision, we took the title proper of that decision as our preferred title. Um, so it's, um, again, the sub rule is carried over from ACR2. Um, <laughs> that these types of rules are a little bit uh, anomalous uh, in that, you know, an, an opinion is not always published separately and might not always be entered under this same title proper. Um, if it's, you know, published just in the court reports, um, they won't, might not have any title proper, just the names of the parties or something else. Um, so this title that we're using in the access point is really the title of the manifestation to use Ferber terms rather than the work, but um, that's the basis we have for it. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, the next question is from Jessica Weimer. Um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, nominative reports entered under, let's see, nominative reports entered under reporter, I believe was an AACR2 compromise with Great Britain, going back to pre-AACR2. I guess it's not a question, it's more of a comment. Um, here's a question from Rhonda Lawrence. Uh, will legacy records retain their choices for treaty entries or will new works force entry changes to those records? Uh, I don't know if I really have an answer for that. Um, you know, a lot of it depends on our ability to update records in a global way. If, I mean, I, I'm pretty certain that authority records that have been established for treaties will be revised as the need arises. <clears throat> and if those are linked to bibliographic records, you know, those entries would be changed. Um, it's whether any kind of programmatic change to authority records could be made is pretty doubtful, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows, we might get that rule changed in the future anyways. Um, but uh, certainly, I don't know, I don't foresee, foresee any great manual recataloging happening in the future, but um, as headings are changed, you know, the 
related bibliographic records will, will probably be changed. Okay, um, next question from Marlene Cooper. Uh, this is a very basic question, but I am confused about when AACR2 rules are in effect and when RDA is. Um, well, that depends <laughs> on fact, the, the various factors. For most of us, uh, AACR2 rules are still in effect um, and uh, will be until, I mean, any library could choose on its own to implement RDA, I suppose. Most people are waiting for the national libraries to uh, implement, <coughs> and there are a lot of test records available already, and um, some few libraries are still using RDA, and the Library of Congress has said that some of its catalogers um, starting this month will uh, continue using RDA, you know, it's to continue to get experience with it and experiment with it. So we're going to have RDA records to deal with, um, and uh, if you use OCLC, OCLC doesn't want you to, you know, convert those back to ACR2. Um, so um, it's a little bit of a f fuzzy answer, um, but for most of us, we're still cataloging on, according to ACR2. That's the short answer. <laughs> Okay, um, Jay Lapache is asking if you could suggest a library with an online catalog that we can look at to see how these RDA practices look when they are being used in an actual catalog. Um, no, I, I don't. I mean, uh, I know some libraries have been doing RDA cataloging, but I haven't <laughs> looked at their catalogs to see, you know, how that looks. So I, I don't know if I could name them or recommend them. Um, so, but on, you know, various listservs, I'm sure you could ask a question and get some suggestions. Okay, here's a question from Timothy uh, Waters. Um, it's RDA 1.6.3.3 says, create a new description if an integrating resource is rebased e.g. if a new set of base volumes is issued for an update loose leaf. But these days, laws, law publishers replace integrating loose leafs with annual paperbacks that may not represent new additions. Do we still make a new record each time a new paperback volume is issued? Um, I believe, I mean, these would often be treated uh, as serials when they turn into these uh, paperbacks that are usually issued every year or maybe every two years. Um, and uh, under my understanding of the current practice, that would be a change in the form of issuance. And at the point where it becomes a serial, um, you would create a new serial record for it. Um, I could be wrong about that. Uh, it's also possible to do each one as a monograph if you choose to do that, or maybe just getting one edition of it. You're not getting it every year. Um, you could treat them as a monograph, but uh, it, to me it doesn't make sense to put them on the record you had for the uh, loose leaf. So th the rule that was cited was about a loose leaf where they have a complete replacement or what they call a rebasing the entire loose leaf, um, and so normally on a loose leaf you have you base your description on the latest iteration, and you keep updating your record. But you would create a new record if the whole thing is replaced and rebased, as they call it. But um, if it turns into a serial, then that's another situation. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, submitted by Chana Cajero. Are qualifiers no longer required for laws, etc.? The example in the presentation did not have one. Uh, they're not mentioned in RDA itself. Um, I have a feeling that uh, we'll continue to have uh, Library of Congress uh, policy statements to, for using uh, qualifiers and laws, etc. Um, I mean, RDA does let you make additions to differentiate um, different uh, access points, so that would seem to be a valid practice in RDA. 
And it's a follow-up uh, from the same person. Uh, any rules? Any rules change in law authority records? Um, I'm not sure what the question means. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, there'll be the same kinds of changes, and as there are in, for all kinds of headings that could be changed. Uh, uh, but specifically law-related, I mean, just the things I talked about concerning treaties are the biggest change. Um, there are other kinds of changes to headings, such as uh, the word departments uh, no longer being abbreviated. Um, and, uh, you know, and personal names, things like uh, we're not, won't be abbreviating B period, born, or won't be abbreviating died, you know, in heading. Um, other things like that are just, you know, general parts of RDA. Uh, maybe the questioner has, you know, a more specific question about that. Okay, this um, actually seems like it's a related question. It's from Rhonda Lawrence, and um, she asks, uh, what do you see as the most problematic change in RDA for legal materials other than for treaties? And could this could include general rules, not just legal rules? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, treaties is a pretty big change and problematic for a lot of us. Um, uh, off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. I mean, most of the changes in RDA, you know, might be, turn out to be a good thing in the long run, but there will be an adjustment for all of us. Um, but Maybe other people have suggestions <laughs> for what's a problem. Okay. Um, uh, this is a question from Calmer Chatto. Um, my concern is changes to the ILS is, wait, sorry. My concern is changes to the ILS as added fields are necessary for RDA. Can you say if the vendors are doing anything in preparation for these changes? And what are some libraries al doing also in preparation for that? Uh, I don't know too much about what vendors are doing. Um, it seems like a chicken and egg thing sometimes. They wait to see what their customers want, and the customers are waiting to see what the vendors do. Um, I know in our library uh, at the university here, um, we use Aleph from Ex Libris, and I'm not sure what kind of changes Ex Libris itself has made, but we've you know validated all these new fields. and so on uh, for use in our catalog. Um, that uh, doesn't mean they'll all be displayed in the catalog, but there's certainly, you know, people will be accepted into our system when they come in on records. Um, that's the most important thing for libraries to do, I think, just to, you know, keep their system up to date in terms of accepting valid mark fields. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made, and I'm not sure who will make them, about displaying certain things, such as the 3.3x fields for content type, media type, etc., um, which in my opinion weren't really made for public display, or um, additions made to uh, access points um, as re related terms, which are going to be a bigger factor in RDA, and how should they be displayed, and how should they affect indexes, et cetera? Um, I don't have any definitive answer on that. Okay, as a follow-up uh, comment to that, Mark Braden uh, said, regarding vendors of ILS, it depends upon the vendor and the ILS product. Because there are many changes in MARC coding due to RDA, each library must talk with its vendor and change load tables, display labels, and screen display of fields, which is... <coughs> Same thing. Yes, I agree. Um, yes. Uh, okay. There's a question from Jean Altshuler. Um, abbreviations are not normally used in RDA. Has an exception been made for laws, etc., and treaties, etc.? Um, yes, that is an exception using etc. Um, at abbreviating that. Um, some people, I think, were not happy with that <laughs> usage, but. Um, uh, I think that's mentioned someplace in RDA as an exception, um, and uh, so you know there's some discussion about 
you know, how useful these preferred titles, laws, et cetera, treaties, et cetera, are, you know, what, what does the et cetera mean? Should we just use laws or without the et cetera or treaties without the et cetera? You know, things like that have been discussed, but so far we've carried over the practice from ACR2. Okay, it looks like we have just under four minutes, so maybe a, a couple of last questions. Um, let's see, Jessica Weimer is asking, compilers as entry, isn't that a major change since we have a lot of compilations? Um, that, uh, I'm not sure what she's referring to. Um, many compilations will be entered under the preferred title, I believe. Um, and uh, so an exception might be a compiler of a digest, but that's the same as under ACR2. Um, I'm not sure what the question I was referring to. Okay. Um, last question, I guess, for now is um, from Rhonda Lawrence, and she's asking, what do you see as a positive and beneficial change to cataloging legal materials due to RDA? Um, well, I'm not sure if there's anything specific to legal materials. Um, as long as we're still using the MARC format, it might be hard to see what the benefits are since we have to squeeze these new rules and concepts into the old formats. Um, but getting into the framework of uh, RDA uh, entities, I mean, Ferber entities and uh, relationships and so on, and creating uh, linked data in a format that can be shared on the web and in ways that our current inf information can't be shared, you know, could be beneficial to us in the future, but it's a long way from here to there. Um, we have to pay attention to the transition efforts that the Library of Congress has started to find something that might re replace the MARC formats, um, but uh, RDA is a step towards thinking of our records as data rather than as, you know, constrict, con you know, almost paragraphs or prose describing something, but turning it into data that can be shared and linked. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you, John, for all your very thorough presentation and answering all those questions in regard to cataloging law materials with RDA. I also want to thank all the attendees. We hope you found today's session use, uh, useful. Um, just Oops. There we go. And um, I want to remind you that you will receive a short online evaluation form. If you could, please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Uh, your comments are very useful to the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee um, to plan new webinar offerings and other course offerings. Um, uh, information about all ELECT's webinars can be found at the ELECT's homepage. We have four more webinars scheduled for this year and many more scheduled for 2012. Uh, suggestions for webinars and other continuing educational opportunities are always welcome. You can contact our chair, Pamela Blue, her email is on your screen, or submit a proposal for a webinar using the form we have online. I put the URL up, but you can also reach it through the homepage. I would also very much like to thank Felicity Dykus for providing the technical support for today's webinar. And um, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other Alex events in the future. Thank you.